Hi everyone. In this video course, I'm going to show you how to create this neon aesthetic for architectural diagrams and illustrations in Rhino 8. So we're going to modify the display settings to generate display styles that have this high contrast, monochrome, neon aesthetic. So we can have things that look like this, that look great for illustrations of massing studies, or we can show something that's like this, that's great for diagram sequencing. We can also have settings like this that are more so for monochrome. So I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step process. I've covered this before in a previous video about site plans, but this one has a little bit more variation to it. And I think moving forward, my next videos are probably going to focus more on architectural detailing, architecture history, and parametric design. I really wanted to cover a wide range of display style settings that you can use in Rhino without transferring it to another program. And at the end of this video, I'm going to show you final exports and how you can lay these out on sheets for presentations. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're going to do is type in options. And then we're going to go down to view. And then on view, we're going to click on display modes. And then we're going to click on rendered. And then we're going to make a copy of that. And then give it whatever name you like, like neon diagram, neon blue diagram, whatever color that you like, right? And then you click OK. I already have these settings, but click OK. So then you're going to go here and then set it to that display style that you just created. All right. So then we'll go back and type in options. And then we'll just go and find that display style that you made. So I called it, for example, neon magenta diagram. OK. So I'll start showing you the options for this one. We want our background to be solid, but that doesn't really matter. I would have your shadow only checked for your ground plane and definitely want shade objects for shade settings and colored material usage. I am going to do objects color for both the color material usage and for back face setting use objects color, which means that it's going to use the, the layer color that you assign it. Okay. And then for visibility, let me just scroll down. I have show surface edges. And then whatever you want to show is optional, but I don't like to show that too many elements, just surface edges. Surface edges is enough, in my opinion, unless you want to show tangent edges and seams for like curved geometry. Annotations and clipping planes and text, that's your choice if you want to show like text and dimensions on here if you like. Now, the next one, which is really important, is your scene lighting. So you want to make sure for your lighting method that you have scene lighting checked, OK? So you would do scene lighting. And the ambient color is very important. That's going to be like the overall color hue. That's redundant, but it's going to be the overall hue of your drawings, right? So right now I have it as a magenta. If I change it to like a cyan or to a blue, everything's going to have like a bluish hue to it. Okay? So that's something really important to understand. I'll give you an example. So like right now, if I change this to like lavender, like you see right now how everything's like magenta right now, has like a magenta hue to it. If I change it to lavender, for example, I do okay. So do you see how it's very light? That's because lavender itself is a very light color, so it's really hard to tell. So a good rule of thumb is that when you're doing an ambient color that's a specific hue other than like gray or black, is to make sure that it's a little bit darker, like around like the 50% or 60% range or 40% range. Lavender is very light, so that's why everything looks really light. So I go back to like magenta, for example, you see it's around 62. So around like, I would say 40 to like 60 or 70, that's where you want to stay. If I do, okay. There you go, you see? Fantastic. So this is very important. So this really is going to determine like the overall color tone of your drawing. So if you're going for a blue tone or for a pink tone, a purple tone, that's what you want to select here. Now, if we go down to, for example, curves, if you want to show curves in your diagrams, you can do that. I typically like to keep it on the defaults, use objects color and use objects width. Again, objects color means it's going to be assigned to the layer color. Objects width means that whatever layer settings you have, that's what's going to be the line weight that it's going to show. You don't have to do that. You can do uh, pixels and give it like a pixel of one or two. That determines the thickness of things. But when I do like diagrams and illustrations, I don't really have curves on here. Okay. So that's important. Let me just go back to these settings. If you want to show your curves and make sure that you have show curves checked over here. 
If you don't, then just have it unchecked, right? Now, for surfaces, now this is all of your surface edges, okay? So like all of your surface edges here, I'm giving this all a single color. I want everything to be the same color, right? So this is gonna show the surface edges, so even the intersecting edges, all those things. I'm giving like this like light lavender. You can give it whatever color you like. And again, I'm saying use object width, which means that it's going to use the width of the layer that you give it. And I'll show you after I close this dialog. Naked edges and ISO curve settings, that's really up to you if you want to show this. I, I never show ISO curves unless I have to, but I would say 99% of the time, I'm never showing ISO curves. Sub D meshes, that's only to be showing meshes, but again, meshes, I typically give everything the same color and no, nothing greater than one for edge thicknesses. And just a quick note is that in Rhino 8, Rhino 8 is what allows you to have the objects width. I think Rhino 7 doesn't give you that setting. So if I just go back real fast, use objects width. I don't think Rhino 7 has this setting, but Rhino 8 does. So if you have Rhino 7 or previous versions, you can just do the pixels and just give like a pixel of one. If you want it thicker, then go more than one. So now the next thing, which is really important, the most important thing in terms of the effects is your shadows. Now, for sure, I'm going to have my shadow size is super high quality, okay? And then my self-shadowing artifacts, super high quality, okay? Now, the edge blurring, this is optional, okay? So right now, I don't have my edges blurred. It's crisp shadows, okay? It's up to you. This is a matter of preference because like when it comes to like curved objects, it actually looks nicer when it, it's blurred a bit. So it's really a matter of preference. So let me just show you what happens when I make it pretty. You see that? See how it gets very blurred around the edges? It's a little bit softer. So these don't look that great on sharp geometry, but when it starts coming to like curved geometry or like geometry that's undulating or waving, it looks nice when the edges are blurred. So just keep that in mind. Everything else you can keep low quality so that you're saving memory. These can all be low, okay? Now, shadow color. Again, if you notice, I'm keeping everything the same tone. So if I go back here to the, to the original one, see my ambient color is magenta and my shadow color is also magenta. The only difference though is that the shadow intensity, right now I have it at 50%. If I make it 100%, it's gonna be very dark. Let me show you. You see? And it starts to get hard to read when you contrast it with the geometry. Some people like that. So it's really a matter of preference. You know, some people like this. I think it's a little hard to read. So I like to keep it on at 50%. Like that. Okay. And then you do, okay. Now the next thing is I want to do print display. And I want to make sure my state is on. Okay. And my color is display. All right. And press enter. That's going to give you like a semi accurate representation of how this, how this is going to look when you export it as a JPEG or a PNG or as a PDF. Now, remember in the, the display settings, I was talking about use object width. So if I go here to the right side, this is what that means. It's the print width, okay? So again, for my surface edge settings, right? I said use object width. So that means when I go over here, I can change the width of this to be very thick edges or very thin edges or hairline, that's your, it's your choice. And the same thing with curves. You can decide dash lines with thick dash lines, light dash lines. That's if you wanna show curves, okay? So that's what it means by use objects with. Now, the two other things I need to show you is how I'm getting these colors here and the lighting. So if you see the color here, right? Again, I said use object color. So that means that's the layer color here, right? So if I change this, maybe I change to like a blue, you see, or like a lavender, you see? Because the lavender is very light, that ambient color is gonna overtake it a bit, okay? That's something to understand, okay? So that's why, in my opinion, it's best to keep everything monochrome. Like if I'm doing a magenta, make everything magenta, or like within that same hue of magenta, 
right? So like for this one, I have this as like this light magenta. So you see, this is magenta, but it's very dark, you see? So I'm gonna change the lightness until I start to get some contrast to it, right? Like that. So it's really, you just have to play around with it and see what you like, all right? We do cancel. Let's go back to original. And then the other thing which is very important is your shadows. So if I go to the render settings over here, let's mark it. So if you don't have it, you can just right click and you can find the render settings over here, okay? So what's really important is if I scroll down, I only have my sun checked. I don't have anything else checked. I don't even have my skylight checked, just my sun settings. And in my sun settings, I have this intensity and I'm like typically Southeast oriented with around like 40 degrees of altitude. It's your choice uh, with how you do this, but just keep in mind that you start to change the lighting. So if I move this down here, for example, you see how it gets like really dark? Because the sun is like very low in the horizon. If I move this here, you see how that lighting changes as well, right? So you need to keep that in mind. So I would say the best, the best method is just always keep it on southeast, around the southeast, and then just around 42 degrees. Okay. You can also change the plane color if you wanted to. If you notice here, I don't have my ground plane checked. You can have a ground plane if you want to, and you can even give a color to your ground plane. But I'm not doing that. I just, I literally have like a physical plane. You don't have to do that. You can have ground plane checked and give it a color that you want. So if I go here, you see I have a plane which is the same color as this. But you don't have to do that. You can literally go in your render settings and just give it a ground plane and give that ground plane a color if you wanted to. So it's a matter of preference. Now, the next thing I want to show you is the print display setting. So if I do view capture to file, this is one way of getting it prepared for like final export, whether you're going to export it to a, a PNG or to a PDF. So if I do view capture to file, right, what I typically do is a resolution. I start off with a viewport and then I do custom, right, and I lock my viewport aspect and I make it quite large. like. 4,000, so it's around 4K. And then the scale, I'll even bump it up by three more times just to increase the quality. This, the file size will, will become quite large, okay? The other way that I can do it is I can do Control-P, which is printing, right? And the exact same thing, Rhino PDF, 300 DPI, raster output, display color, okay? And then you decide how you wanna capture the view, whether it's by window or by extents, it's your choice. And what's really important is your line type and line widths, okay? So if I do match viewport display, it's going to match how it looks like on the screen, okay? If you do match pattern definition, that means whatever settings that you placed in your layer settings, it's going to match your layer settings, so like that 0 0.3 width, right? Because we updated that, you actually want to do it like that so that you're seeing the actual thickness of the line widths that you adjusted in your layers. So, so that's really important to understand. Like, let me repeat that. Match viewport display, you're going to match what you see on the screen. And then match pattern definitions, whatever settings you gave it in your layer settings. Okay. And then if you scroll down here, this is your choice if you want to show your background color. And any of these is all your choice if you want to show these things or not. And then you just click OK and it'll come off as a PDF. I would say the color output as printing is a little bit better than the view capture to file, but it takes longer. So I always just do view capture to file because it's typically I'm presenting things in digital space. And even when I print things, it's the variation is so minuscule that it's not worth it to you know waste time and save that extra time. But some people like PDFs. So again, I always do view capture to file. Now there's one other thing that I want to show you. Let me just close this. Let me go back here. So you see this here right now, this was on that settings I just showed you, the neon magenta diagram, right? So you can create a non-monochrome contrasting style. So for example, if I go here, I created the exact same settings, but I called it neon blue instead of magenta. So you see, I get this, right? So if I go to options, the only difference that I did is that for neon blue, my ambient, my ambient color is like this like blue hue and the shadow color is also this like dark blue, okay? But it doesn't work with all colors. 
So because you see here, this right now is still like this light magenta with that blue ambient color. What I showed you before, everything was the magenta hue. You see this one, everything is magenta hue, even the layers. But this one, the ambient color and the shadows are this blue, but my layers are still this magenta. If I flipped it into the inverse, it's going to actually be harder to read because the blue has a stronger value than the magenta. The, the blue is closer to black than magenta is. So it's going to overpower it. That's why the magenta reads well on here. So you actually have to test your colors out if you want to have like this like contrasting look where the ambient color and the shadow is different than what you're giving your layer color to be. Or you can just play it safe and just keep everything like monochrome, right? So like every, the shadows are magenta, the ambient color is magenta, and the layer is magenta. If you want to start doing contrasting, then you have to start playing around with the colors. But the general rule of thumb is that the layer color needs to be less than the value of the ambient color, or it's going to be overtaken by that ambient color. Like, for example, yellow is closer to white than any other color. So it's understanding like that type of like color combination. And let me just toggle through. Let me show you some other examples. So like this is another great example, right? So like this is like a curved, like this curved geometry, right? Remember when I was saying that the blurred edges look better on curved geometry? This is a good example of showing like curved geometry where blurred edges look a little bit better. Let me change this to neon blue. There you go. So you see it's really sharp. The thing is sharp here. If I go back to options, and let me just go to the neon blue one, go to shadows, and then let me just make edge blurring just a little bit more. There you go. You see how it's like much softer now, if you noticed? See, it's very soft now. Let me just go back so you see the difference. Might be a slight lag. See, it's very sharp here. Then when I go here, it's really soft. So again, this works great for like curved, carved in geometries. Okay. So that's about it. So I'm going to transition over and show you final exports of how this can look great as like a diagram on a sheet for final presentation, for final studio project presentation, for mid review. And again, I'm not taking this to Illustrator. I'm only taking this to InDesign to do like annotations and labels, which it makes it even look much better. Okay. So I'm just going to toggle through some images where you're going to see different types of text, text layout different compositions, like how I can zoom in on certain elements, how I can create this nice abstract look. I think this is great for a lot of conceptually driven projects, or you want to really push the conceptual representation of your design language and really emphasize certain elements, right? So for example, these geometries, right, you're getting a clear representation of lighting, shadow, form, massing, geometry, right? Because everything's so stark and high contrast, even, even here right? Like I really can see what's curving, what's surface, what's hard, what's soft because of the high contrast. And it's not over realistic, right? It's more conceptual, a little bit more, more playful with how you're representing your architectural graphics. So yeah, again, I'm just going to keep shuffling through these graphic styles just to show you all the different layout options and representational styles. Again, like I said in the beginning of the video, I'm going to start transitioning over to different topics in my channel because I've done a lot of display style settings that hopefully is helpful. And I want to start focusing more on architectural details, architectural detail representations, history, like architectural history and theory, and parametric design. So if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. And if you have any comments or questions, just leave it in the comment section below. Thank you.